welcome to Park Road Baptist Church, whether you're a member here or whether you've joined us on YouTube. I'm just uh, going to read a few verses from Psalm 139 uh, from the Message Version. God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I am an open book to you, even from a distance. You know where, what I am thinking. You know when when I leave and when I get back, when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you are there. I look up ahead and you are there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much for me, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go from your spirit to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on the morning's wings to the far western horizon, you find me there also. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed with a light. In fact, the darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and night, they are all the same to you. I don't know what kind of week you've had, but I've had, um, I'm not too well at the moment with my chest. And I know that God is with me, whether I'm up or down, whether I'm feeling lonely or feeling full of people. But at the moment, I don't know how you're feeling this week, but sometimes I have doubts. And the first song we're going to sing in a little while is My Lighthouse. It's in my wrestling and in my doubt. But actually in my wrestling and in my doubt, God understands that sometimes I could doubt him. But in this psalm, it says that he's going to be there everywhere with you. And I think that is really encouraging, especially in this time of coronavirus. So I just want to pray and then we're going to sing My Lighthouse and Light of the World. Dear Lord, I thank you that you are the light in our darkness and light and darkness are the same to you. I pray that you just be with us as we worship together this morning, that you will guide and lead our worship. Amen. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Lead me through. You are the peace in my trouble. 
troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you.
Don't worry, it is I, Mark. Have you ever wanted to have a superpower where you could do something here in Britain and, and you would affect somebody, say, in Africa? You'd click your fingers and something would happen to somebody in, in Saudi Arabia. Or you'd clap your hands and something would happen to somebody in China. It'd be amazing if you had that power wouldn't it? That you could do something in one country and affect somebody at the other side of the world. Amazing. Do you know, Christians have an amazing power. When we pray, we can affect people on the other side of the world. The power has nothing to do with us. It all comes down to the power of Jesus. Today we're going to learn a true story about a Roman soldier who discovered the power of Jesus. There was a Roman centurion who lived near Capernaum. Now a Roman centurion was a very powerful person. He was in charge of a hundred soldiers. Now this centurion was respected and he helped the Jewish people. This Roman centurion servant became deathly ill and the centurion was very worried and he tried to help his servant but with no success. At the same time, Jesus was becoming famous for healing people. Even the Romans had heard of Jesus' power to heal. Now normally, Romans and Jews didn't mix with each other. Jesus was a Jew, so the Roman centurion asked some important Jews to go and ask Jesus to come and help his servant. This was probably a bit awkward for these men. Many Jews marvelled at the power of Jesus, but some Jewish leaders didn't like him. The elders may have been reluctant to approach Jesus, but as the centurion was well respected, they did as he asked. And when the Jewish elders came to Jesus, they begged him to go to see the centurion. They said, this man's a good man, he's a kind man. He even helped build our local synagogue. Jesus agreed to go out of his way to help this foreign Roman centurion and his servant. The centurion lived a little, a little way away from the Jewish people because, as I said, Jews and Romans don't mix. And Jews would never go to a Gentile's house. As Jesus approached the man's home, the centurion sent friends saying to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself any further. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Although the centurion was a very powerful man, he was also humble. God likes humble people. The centurion believed that Jesus had the authority from God to heal people. The centurion told Jesus that he had the power to command his soldiers. I tell this man, march to that town. I tell this man, pick up this heavy backpack and march to that town over there. And they have to do it because I'm the man in charge. And in the same way, I know you, Jesus, have the power to simply say to illness, go and you can command that my slave will be healed. Jesus was amazed when he heard this. He turned to the crowd of people following him and said, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. The centurion believed in Jesus' power and God's authority. When the friends of the centurion returned to his house, there was great joy because his servant was completely healed. He'd been healed at the moment Jesus had said that the servant would be healed. Isn't it wonderful to know that we can pray even in Britain and our prayers 
will be heard by God in heaven and he will help whoever we have prayed for in the world. He has the whole world in his hands and we can help pray, cooperate with God in his purposes for looking after his beautiful world and all these special people. Let us pray. Lord of all the earth, as the Hebrews sought to enter the promised land, a river blocked their way. They had seen you part the Red Sea, but now it was time to see you in a new way. You told them you had given them the land and that you would drive out their enemies if they would do what you said. So you sent their priests into the Jordan and as their feet touched the water's edge, you stopped the waters from flowing and dried up the riverbed so the people could cross over, offering you honour and praises all along the way. You are a great and awesome God who still does mighty acts on behalf of your people. Lord of all the earth, sometimes it can be difficult to see how you will make a way where there seems to be no way. I wish I could know what the Hebrews were thinking as they stood along the banks of the Jordan after hearing that you had instructed them to walk through it into the promised land. Did they doubt you, just as I sometimes do? Did they immediately give you thanks? Or did they wait until they saw the water begin to stop flowing? I confess to you, Lord of all the earth, I often forget that you have control over the earth you created. The elements are nothing to you. After all, you made them. You're not bound by the laws of science. The earth is your playground and it is under your command. Lord of all the earth, thank you for your creation and for your creating power. It's comforting to know that nothing is too big for you or removed from your control. The winds may rage and the storms shake the ground, but nothing shakes you. Nothing surprises you. Thank you for your ability to subdue the creation underneath you. In you I find my peace. Lord of all the earth, I, I ask you for special grace that I might keep my eyes on Jesus, not on the waves surrounding me, not on the water you're calling me to walk out into. Even if the waters were peaceful, my mind would still doubt that I could walk on them. As Peter sank when he looked down, I ask that I will not sink. May my eyes always be on you. And as the Hebrews witness you, stop the running water. I pray you'll help me to do whatever you ask me to do so that I can witness your miraculous interventions in my life. Amen. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow's blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up. <laughs> Take your mat and go home.
And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Mm. got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No. They pour new wine into new wineskins. And both are preserved. We will now sing a song which will be new to some of you. It's a responsive song called He is Worthy. It's based on Revelation chapter 5. Peter will lead the singing and if you would join in with the rest of the band where it says all at the beginning of the line or all this chorus. We do, but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do, do you wish that you could see it all made you? We do, is all creation. 
is a new creation coming. It is. It is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? exciting and challenging um, focus upon who Jesus is, what he's come to do. And today is going to be continuing that. And we're looking at the authority of King Jesus. And we're also going to be having uh, some testimonies as well about how the authority of Jesus is transforming people's lives. But let's begin in prayer because without the Lord Jesus' help, we, we can't really hear and respond in the way that he would long for us to do. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all life, we ask for your help now uh, that you would be at work in our hearts and minds to hear and to respond in the way that you long for us to. Please help me as I convey this message that you would work through everything that takes place in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. On the first slide on the screen here, you will see uh, a rather unusual uh, um, drone carrying a rescue, a life ring, into the ocean. All of this week, my family and I have had this kind of focus of 
the search and rescue mission, things that get lost and need rescuing. So let me tell a little, let you, you a little about what's been getting lost in our family. Uh, firstly, at the beginning of, of this week, my sons lost two important things that they, 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 they enjoy playing with. One was a flying saucer uh, that you propel, pull, if you'll see in this second slide here, and it got stuck in a tree opposite our house, and we couldn't get it back. Oh dear. And the second thing that we lost on the same evening was a lovely yellow frisbee. Uh, you'll see on the screen again, but our one had a wonderful message on it that Jesus loves you. Unfortunately, one of my boys lost it in some very deep stinging nettles, and Daddy went diving in, even with trousers on, thankfully, but it didn't stop me from getting a little bit stung by those stinging nettles. Ouch! And we didn't find it. Frustrating. Got back home, I'm putting my uh, uh, youngest son to bed, and we're saying our prayers together. And my youngest son says, Daddy, we need to ask Jesus to help us find both of those items, don't we? Yes, son, you're absolutely right. Let's ask Jesus for his help. And we did. And that next day, Daddy went out there, and with the Lord's help, I managed to retrieve the flying saucer from the stocking up high in the tree. And then our second mission to go and retrieve the frisbee, before we got stuck in, we pulled together as a family and we asked Jesus to help us. And guess what happened? Within one minute, we found the frisbee with the message, Jesus loves you on it. Wonderful. And we gave thanks to the Lord there and then. How great he is in caring for every need. But that wasn't the end of this search and rescue what is lost focus in our family this past week. The next thing to happen was shock horror. We find that our hamster has escaped from his cage. Someone had left it open and he's nowhere to be seen. And we're getting worried because there's lots of things that our hamster might nibble on that he shouldn't do and he might die. So again, we're challenged to ask the Lord Jesus to help us and to rescue and keep our little hamster alive. Two hours later, my youngest son is shouting down the stairs, Mummy, Daddy, he's in my room! And we all go rushing up and there he is in the middle of the carpet with a cheeky little look on his face. Thankfully, he's alive and he's safe and we put him back in his cage and we thank the Lord for helping us. The fifth and final thing that happened this week, this time with some people, some a family in our neighbourhood. Very late at night, we hear some serious domestic argument going on and we are really concerned for them and um, we pray for them, for, for the Lord's help to step in the situation, to calm things down and to help them. And the following day, we were stirred to write a little message and to put a, a Christian message of hope in a letter and post it through their door and prayed that, uh, that the Lord Jesus would be at work in that family's life. And we're still praying for, for him to, uh, to do something special there, to join us in prayer for that family. The Lost and Rescue Mission. It's really, really got to me. And, um, and what has that got to do with Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8 and chapter 9, with the thinking at the moment? Well, I've got a question to lead us into that, and it's up on your screen. What is our greatest need, do you think? There are many answers to that. Psychologists... Um, would probably tell you um, straight away about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and many other things they may come up with. But what does the Bible say? What does Matthew's Gospel say? What does Jesus say our greatest need is? Well, in Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, we have a wonderful, exciting snapshot of Jesus' miracles and his powerful authority over everything, including... Things like disease over his followers, his disciples, authority over disasters, authority over demons, evil spirits. He's got power and authority over sin. He has authority over our salvation, over death, over disability, and over the devil, our arch enemy. And we have this wonderful demonstration in, in Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, and I encourage you to really uh, take time to read all that goes on there. And, and this helps us to focus on that Jesus is amazing. Yet again, we see he's full of power and authority. And I want to uh, focus on just one story. Um, and that's from Matthew chapter 9, 
and the first eight verses. And it's about the paralyzed man. And this man um, is in desperate need and he has friends that care for him and want him to be transformed by Jesus. And they bring him to Jesus. And we get a bit of a shock here because the very first thing that Jesus focuses in on is not the fact that the man can't walk and his legs are paralyzed, but he focuses on the greatest need that we all have. And that is his sinful condition. And he says to him, don't lose hope. Your sins are forgiven. And this prompts some of the religious people there to be outraged because they say, who, who do you think you are? How dare you think you can forgive sin? Only God can do that. Do you think you are are you equal to God? And Jesus responds and says, which do you think is easier to do? For me to forgive sins or to ask this man to get up and walk? But to demonstrate that I have authority from the Father to forgive sins, I will do both. His sins are forgiven. And I command him now to be healed and to pick up his mat and walk. And that's exactly what happens. Wow. What power and authority this Jesus has. And in, 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 slide, in, the, in the slide here, um, our greatest need that we were asking earlier on is to be saved and forgiven from our sin. It's complete salvation. Jesus' name means saviour from sin. And that includes justification and sanctification, two big words about being made completely right with God and that he transforms our very heart to give us a new heart. In this next picture here, a bit of an unusual one. Why, why a funeral? Who, whose funeral? In fact, this is a, a funeral of my uh, dear cousin, Suzanne. Uh, very recently, she died of the coronavirus, COVID-19. But do you notice in the picture, there's a powerful ray of sunlight that's beaming down right on her coffin and with the, uh, the coffin bearers there. And even in the midst of this sad time, many of us were reminded that there's hope. And that hope is in Jesus, the light of the world, who removes all darkness, who has power over death and all things. So even in a, in a funeral, we could be reminded of these things, that Jesus has all authority and power. And he can give us hope in the darkest of times. In this next slide here, you'll see on the screen, we're reminded that Jesus possesses absolute authority in the whole wide world. And he deserves and calls for response from all of us towards him. How do we relate to him? Do we respond to him as Lord or not? Jesus is the only one that can meet our greatest need because he provides for our forgiveness of sin and he defeats death on our behalf. I wonder about you right now, whoever's listening. You may be thinking, well, yeah, these stories may have happened. I'm not sure. Can really, this same Jesus have authority and power to help me in my situation? I believe he can. I really believe he can. But what is your response going to be to this awesome King Jesus today? Have you ever submitted to him and surrendered fully to him before? And what about now? Well, after our next worship song, we're going to hear some testimonies of how other disciples of Jesus in our church family have responded to the authority of Jesus in their own lives. And I'm looking forward to hearing them. So let's uh, join together in praise and worship, and then we'll hear these powerful testimonies. God bless you.
two former members of Pot Row Baptist Church, that's Liz Cook and Bill Cook with Liz Cook from uh, who's moved to Spain, and also the Chipper family, that's Christy and Joe and Shania Chipper. And we are also going to have three bonus testimonies that you will have coming on online on Monday next week, and that's from Carol Little and uh, Chris Meisen, and also a friend from Pot Row, uh, Richard Stewart. Good morning everyone. I'm so happy to be able to join you this morning on WhatsApp. Firstly, I'd like to say that we do miss you all. We think of you often and pray for you and generally keep up to date with what's going on at Park Road Baptist Church. And it's wonderful to be back with you this morning. Patrick asked if I would share a short testimony of what God has done in my life. Phil, knowing me very well, pointed out to me that I only had three minutes, not three hours. I've always loved all sorts of music, but there is one song that is often sung at funerals, which I find incredibly sad. It is a song that sums up a final declaration of a person's life here on earth. The song is called, I Did It My Way, made famous by Frank Sinatra. Some of the lyrics read, But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spat it out. I faced it all and I stood tall. I did it my way. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has naught. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows. I did it my way. I spent my early years in care and I had strong feelings of rejection and abandonment and not being good enough and not fitting in throughout my childhood. When I was 24 years old, my father was murdered and it was a big story in the media. And then a year later came the court case. It broke me. I was devastated and a mass of painful thoughts and feelings. And at the time I reached out and I found alcohol as a way to cope. I wanted to be numb. I did not want to feel. And this began a terrifying 20 year addiction to alcohol. Every day I reached out to alcohol over my marriage, my children, my job, my home, my family and friends, everything and everybody. Alcohol was my God and addiction was my consequence. Towards the end of my alcohol addiction, I met my now husband, Phil, 
and we started a relationship. He quickly became aware of my alcoholism and we agreed to end our relationship and I was drunk even then. The next day, although I didn't realise it at the time, I made a choice. There was a voice inside of me saying that I was not going to drink over this. I reached out and asked God to help me and so began my healing and my relationship with my Father God. He clearly showed me the debris field that was my life. It was like looking at an aeroplane crash where everything and everybody was destroyed. I knew I didn't want to do it my way anymore. I needed and wanted to do it God's way. I'd always believed that God was very harsh. He wanted to punish me. He was a God of anger and strictness. I believed that I was too bad and I had gone too far for him to forgive me. I was so, so wrong. He had always been there waiting for me to reach the end of myself so that I could begin a relationship with him. My healing and relationship with God my Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit had begun. It wasn't always easy and it was step by step, day by day, choice by, by choice to reach out to my Father God. Sometimes I stumbled, but he helped me up and moved me forward. I had two wonderful friends, Christian friends, who had stuck by me all through my drinking. They didn't judge me, they loved me. They mentored me and they revealed God's love for me and that he had hope and a future for me. I learned that God was full of grace, full of mercy and full of kindness and that I wasn't too bad to be forgiven because Jesus died on a cross so I could be forgiven totally. I began to go to church and became part of God's family. I realised that I needed to ask him daily, not my will, but your will be done to fully trust that he had a plan for my life. I began to read my Bible and there I found out that God had revealed himself in the life of Jesus and throughout the Old and New Testament accounts. I asked the Holy Spirit to guide me and to show me how to live day by day. It is a journey I'm still on, one day at a time one choice at a time. There have been highs and lows, but God has graciously brought me safe this far. By the way, Phil and I got back together again and we have been happily married for 20 years. So I asked the Lord what he would like me to say this morning to you and to myself, and I felt he replied. Every day we have a choice to reach out for many things. Make our first choice to reach out to him, to put our hand in his hand and do it God's way. Thank you. Well, it's been almost four years um, since you last saw us and I expect you weren't gonna see us, expect to see us again anytime soon, but, but here we are. We're enjoying, as you can see, the sun, lockdown, and the beautiful blessings of our garden. Um, but Patrick has asked us to share a little bit about the latest stage of our journey and about following Christ. But we're going to start with Shania. Shania's going to tell her, uh, you her exciting news about last year. We are here in March, on the 3rd of March. I got baptised and I, um, I choose to get baptised. Yay! And it was a lovely day, wasn't it? Yes, yes. But the, the true Anglican the tradition of not too much water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the journey so far, well for us, I think what it was when we were in Rushton and you think 
And we thought, and I thought, that we were all, we'd all arrived, we were doing what God wanted us to do. And I think for me that was the time that I first realised that we're actually on a journey and that God never likes us to get too comfortable doing what we always do. Um, so to that end, we, we set off and, and relocated to Ledbury in Herefordshire. Um, and I went to theological college, which was quite interesting. We did the first year and it was about halfway through the second year when I was uh, arranging my placement, uh, my ministry placement, it became apparent that the the whole course that I was doing had changed and um, it beggars the question then you ask God what are you playing at because we were called out of Rushton we moved and everything suddenly went pear-shaped um, but that's the time for me when God really speaks when things have gone so far wrong out of our control completely and the church that I had my placement with uh, was an Anglican church and the rest as they say is history because the placement started and continued after I'd left Regents College and through the minister there I started the process and I'm now on the route to ordination as um, an Anglican vicar, which is something unusual, I think, for a charismatic Baptist, but I think that's just Bishop Richard's sense of humour. So that's 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 the story so far. Mm, and we still don't quite know where it's going to end up. Um, but what I would say is, throughout our lives, we've taken a step, following what we thought God was asking us to do. And it never turns out how we think it's going to do. And to be honest, a lot of times if I'd known, I wouldn't have taken that first step. If I'd known where it would end up, or how, how it wouldn't end up, I might not have taken that step. It's, just, the, it's the hiccups on the way. But when you get past the hiccups, <laughs> then you look back and you can see God's hand through it all. Yeah, the verse. But here's the verse that, that kept me going um, through that transition time, once you've stepped out and things have gone pear-shaped. And it's from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And I think, um, for me, that's good enough. Yeah, so we don't say we don't know where we're going to end up entirely, but it's exciting, and uh, God's certainly blessing us in all sorts of ways in, in the meantime. So love to you all, and we do miss you all, and uh, we hope you're all well too. Okay. So yes, when the lockdown lifts, maybe we'll get to Rushton. Okay. Yes. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye. So. After hearing all these powerful personal testimonies from Liz and from the Chippers, and there'll be the bonus ones, don't forget on Monday. So what? What are we going to do with this ourselves? For me, I'm trusting afresh with my whole being that Jesus has saved me from the punishment and power and presence of sin. And he's done everything to keep my fallen nature dead and buried. What's more, I'm trusting in his resurrection power and the Holy Spirit within me, day by day, to help me live more fully for him. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that we've heard uh, today about your authority and your call and challenge for us to surrender to you, the one who, uh, who deserves the greatest allegiance in every aspect of our lives. Please help us. To, uh, to make that response every day, including today. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest clouds and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. You're the only answer to the dark. You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away
right in every situation. You speak the power to prevail. Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase Your 